And now type confusions. What are they? They're the use of acid to alter the interpretation of a data's type. Now, me US guy, no like lot word chunk. So instead of type confusion, we're gonna call it Tyco, Tyco vulnerabilities. And Tyco might make you think of these remote controlled cars from the 90s where nothing was cooler than looking like a rat with sunglasses and a backwards cap wearing sneakers and a t-shirt over a t-shirt. Or Tycho may make you think of the Tycho Crater, named after Tycho Brahe. Of course, us English speakers like to mispronounce this as Tycho, which I recently learned when I had a student named Tico in one of my classes. But that's neither here nor there. What is here is the fact that apparently his name wasn't even Tycho. It was Teague O. Tinsen Brahe or Bra. I don't know whether it's Brahe or Bra because there's all sorts of different pronunciations on the internet. Anyways, so what are the common causes of Tycho vulnerabilities? Well, one of them is if you're designing in such a way that there is some particular field that indicates the data's type, then if an attacker can manipulate that field, that would allow for type confusion. And object-oriented programming is really just a subtype of this particular type of problem because in object-oriented C++, you have the interpretation of data according to types having to do with complicated class hierarchies of parents and children and multiple inheritance and things like that. So C++ code very often has type confusion vulnerabilities if the attacker can manipulate the interpretation. Now C++ has a variety of forms of type casting, and of course you can still use the old C style casting where you just cast a pointer to some new type. And that is dangerous because if you do it incorrectly, then the code will just be accessing data in the new type definition when it's not correct for the old type data. But let's focus on the C++-isms here. There is the static cast, which takes a target class that it's typecasting it to, and some particular object of some other class. Now this is theoretically checked at compile time, but not at runtime. And I have a quotes around checked because as you'll see in some examples here in a second, the checks may be insufficient for avoiding actual type confusion. Then there's dynamic cast, and that's the thing that you should actually be using. It is checked at runtime rather than compile time, although there are a few checks at compile time as well. But unfortunately, a lot of people don't use dynamic cast because it has performance overhead. So this is safe, but not everybody is using it. So dynamic cast, you know, if you take anything away from the C++ casting, the only thing is use dynamic cast and nothing else. Of course, if you do that, then you have to do performance evaluations of what the implications are. And then finally, there's reinterpret cast, which is similarly dangerous to static cast. So in general, upcasting is safe because you're narrowing the definition of something. So if you have an animal class and there's dogs and there's cats, well then treating a dog as an animal is always going to be safe because it's basically using a subset of the data that is available for dog, only that subset that's available as an animal. But if you upcast and then you downcast, that is where you get into trouble because technically it is legal to go from dog to animal and technically it is legal to go from animal to cat. But if the source object was a cat and you static cast it to an animal and then you static cast it down to a dog, well, you've just forced a cat to be interpreted as a dog. And although the compiler will say, yeah, going from an animal to a, a dog is totally fine, the reality is this is going to cause problems because now you will have access to members of the dog class, which may or may not exist or may not be the correct and same type from the cat class. So let's see a quick real example of that. Let's say we have a base class with a whole bunch of nothing going on. Then we have the execute class as a subclass of base. And all it does is take in a string and it calls system to execute that path as a executable. Then there's a greeter class, which is a subclass of base. And all that does is take in a string and it prints out the string. So main is going to instantiate a new greeter object and store it in the base pointer B1. It's going to instantiate a new execute object and it's going to store it in B2 and it's got a greeter pointer. So it can take B1, which is of type greeter and which was stored in the base class pointer, and it can static cast it to a greeter 
and that is going to be safe and legal because it's just casting a greeter to a greeter. But if it does a static cast of B2, which was an execute to a greeter, and then it calls the function say hi from the greeter, well, because now it has been type confused because it has turned an execute class into a greeter class, there's only a single function in each of these. And so instead of executing the function say hi, it's going to be executing the function exec behind the scenes. So even though the code looks like it's saying hi, it's actually executing this as a path to an executable. And so this will pop open the calc if you run it on a Unix system. And the perhaps surprising thing here is the fact that it allows this, right? This static cast is supposed to have compile time checks, right? So why does it allow that? Well, it allows that because B2 is a base. It's a base class. And so it's okay to cast from a base class to a subclass such as G the greeter. It's okay according to compilation rules, but we know this is actually going to cause an issue. So the problem here is that we have a greeter object which has a virtual function. And so the object itself, there's no member. So it's just a pointer to a table that says, you know, where you can find the function to the call. So greeter has a say hi and execute has an exec. But the problem is when they become type confused, you think you're operating on a greeter object, but actually you're operating on an execute object and therefore calling say hi calls through to exec. And so more generically, you can have any sort of type confusion. And this can be a problem either because of the overlapping of virtual functions or because of the overlapping of members. So if this object type one is interpreted as object type two, then when you think you're accessing, you know, member four of type four, you're actually getting something of type one and that can cause a problem. Similarly, you're calling the wrong functions and therefore the parameters to those functions may be interpreted as different types than what the actual data is. So if we return to this example and we change it to be a dynamic cast instead, well, then we'll actually get a compile time error. So we said dynamic casts are supposed to give you runtime errors and static casts compile time errors. So what's going on? Well, it says that, you know, the source type is not polymorphic. So if we had more complicated polymorphic classes, then dynamic cast wouldn't have a problem here at compile time. It would just do the actual checks at runtime. But this is good for us, right? It's always better if there's some sort of sanity check at compile time instead of runtime. So again, this is why dynamic cast is the C++ cast you want to use if you can absorb the performance penalty. And finally, if we just want to see static cast actually giving us a compile time check, then we have to go a little bit out of our way for this trivial example, create a new base class to uh, base two, and then we have greeter two, which is a subtype uh, subclass of base two. And then we create a greeter two and we explicitly cast greeter two into a greeter. And so that will at least give us an actual compile time check. So it's going to say invalid static cast from type base two to type greeter. All right, so I want you to bear with us in this section. I thought that it was more important for this particular section for you to be able to see the recurring patterns rather than spreading these examples all over the place in terms of user space, kernel space, firmware, and virtualization. So in this particular thing, the examples that were easiest to find and that you would have the appropriate background for are mostly kernel examples. So it's going to be kernel example heavy here, and we'll try to increase the number of examples in the future to have other places. And, you know, we have very much a selection bias. It's not just the choosing of kernel examples. One of the other major sources of type confusion vulnerabilities are browsers. And so browsers typically have some sort of problem in their JavaScript interpreter dealing with these objects that JavaScript manages. But because we can't assume you know assembly, we can't assume you know JavaScript, uh, it would just take way too much time to explain all of the background about the, the necessary background about JavaScript in order for you to understand it. And even me personally, I don't know JavaScript that well, so it would take me a ton of time in order to understand it well enough, to explain it well enough for you to understand. So again, we're going to be leaving those types of vulnerabilities out of the class for now. But enough with the caveats, let's go look at some real vulnerabilities.